it's more about the journey and how we get there rather than the outcome. Right. And there might be a couple switches that, like, you know, obviously we haven't seen it, so they might be just, like, completely, you know, completely new things that, that get brought up. But, like, we're six years in. Like, we, we know what's going to happen. Yeah, for sure. And welcome to the Down Front Podcast. How's it going, guys? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to need a bit more energy. Uh, do a couple Red Bulls, you know, a lot of other, you know, couple of snow cones, illegal, illegal snow cones, sorry. Red, red pixie Bull sticks. <laughs> well, pixie sticks, Red Bull, Red Bull and wine, you said? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all the kids are drinking these days. Red Bull and wine together? That sounds well, disgusting. You, you chug a Red Bull and then you chase it with a shot of your darkest red wine. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we can make it a thing. Yeah, uh, hashtag Red Bull and Wine. Let's get it going. Uh, yeah, I'm going to tweet that out right now, actually. So <laughs> I'm interested to see if people are like, oh, really? Yeah, like, yeah let's just go. You know, what's the worst that can happen, right? <laughs> Nothing. Well, Nothing lose all credibility for friends with blends. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like anti synergy. <laughs> and we are the Down and Front Podcast. Wow, that was a terrible tangent. Uh, in which we talk about movies, TV shows, a bunch of nerdy stuff as well. So I'm really excited to talk about one of our feature films tonight. Um, we actually go back into the universe again of the King Arthur universe. Uh, this version with Guy Ritchie starring a bunch of people, but mainly uh, Jude Law. And it's a really cool, really uh, really strong sort of supporting cast. But I'm really excited to kind of dissect that with a couple people that we hear with. So I actually start talk about a people... That I'm here with, and on my left, I have the beautiful Mike the Shredder. Blew it. How's it going, Mike? Yo, what's going on, guys? Chilling, man. Chilling. Good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you guys as well. Doing that Skype thing. Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, What you you watching? What you drinking? So, what I'm drinking, I got the Brooklyn Summer Ale. It's pretty solid. Uh, No complaints. It's really light. Which uh, I didn't know I was looking for right now, but now that I'm into it, I'm kind of into it. You know, like I, I felt like today was more of a heavier beer day, but uh, we're here. You know, we're alive. We're loving it. Um, still, even though it's light, still has a whole bunch of flavor, which I really respect. Um, in terms of what we've been watching, truthfully, uh, I woke up, went to work, and then now I'm here. <laughs> so <laughs> I haven't, I literally haven't had any any sort of relaxing time uh, since we last met. Uh, so I, I'm still not doing anything. All right. Well, I mean, I want to say thanks for coming out. I definitely had that um, Brooklyn Lager, Brooklyn Summer. Um, I think maybe a couple weeks weekends ago. Um, mm. Super smooth, very good. I mean, I think the majority of things are either going to the rosé portion of it, or they're going to a more kind of a summer ale portion of it. For right now, that's literally everything that I've been drinking, and you know, I don't mind it. I definitely do not mind it. So that other magical voice that you heard is my other best friend, uh, Mike. This guy is a Mocha Mike Moreno. How's it going, man? Hey, man. How's it going? Amazing. Glad to be back uh, chatting about King Arthur. I'm a big fan. I'm actually a huge sucker for any sort of fantasy war epic. So give me any even somewhat um, noticeable actor swinging a sword or shooting a bow and arrow, and I'm probably going to be happy. Um, um, so what it about definitely Warcraft? wasn't all roses for this movie, but, but I'm excited to chat about it. What about okay. Warcraft in that case? Oh, so Warcraft? Absolutely enjoyed every minute of it. It is a stinking fiery trash pile of a movie okay but again swords and and bows and arrows i was happy even though it was complete and utter trash yeah but we, <laughs> we, we can talk about that i'm excited that was a, a particular point that i actually brought up uh and that was actually was a win but we'll get into that but uh what you been watching what you sipping on yeah so um as far as what i'm watching uh things haven't changed too much from the last time i was on the show i am still making my way through the new season of um the unbreakable kimmy schmidt um, which I encourage anyone to see because I think it's the the high point of the series so far. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a little boring, though, since I have been watching that for a minute. So I will say that one thing that I am excited about watching, um, Netflix dropped today the teaser for its new Castlevania anime. Hmm. Uh, it's, a, it's a short teaser. It doesn't show a lot. It shows some, some, some scenes. It shows Dracula's castle. It shows a bit of the animation style. I'm very excited for it. I'm a, a bit of an anime nerd. Warren, you're already aware of that. You and I have definitely had... Plenty of long conversations about Attack on Titan, Naruto, all kinds of stuff. 
But um, but yeah, Netflix has some pretty cool anime, uh, like original anime that they've put out, and I think this is going to be another another big one. So I'm looking forward to that. I think um, even, I think you even like the uh, Deadly Sins one that's on Netflix, Seven Deadly Sins. Have you seen that? I have. I saw the first season of that. I'm not a fan of it, like the story, but it's it's a good enough anime to watch and like have in the background if I need if I don't have to like focus entirely. Don't watch the second season though. Oh yeah, yeah. I haven't yet. I haven't yeah. yet. I haven't had that much. Oh. They only had four. They only had four episodes, and I can see why they only had four episodes. But I thought it was an interesting premise. If anything, it's kind of like a team building one. Um, me and Jesse really talked about, especially a lot on the show. Um, we talked about Sword Art Online and only watching the first season and only watching the first section of the first season because the second season gets kind of off the rails. Uh, the gun, the gun, gun game was uh, pretty dope, and then everything else not so much. But okay, oh, yeah. What you sipping on? Yeah, so that's for what I'm drinking. It's Wino Wednesday here in Brooklyn. So I am sipping on a nice tall bottle of La Granja. Nice. This is a Spanish wine um, from Spain. <laughs> uh, the the <laughs> logo, which I think is pretty cool, is a zebra that's half painted red. Um, I'm not sure if that's some sort of political statement, but it's what it is. And it is a blend of a Tempranillo and the Garnacha, which, Warren, I'm sure you can educate me on all that good stuff. All I know is that it tastes very deep and very full-bodied and other words that i've learned to say by mimicking others who actually know things about wine hashtag um, well hashtag friends with blends we don't even t- use those terms we just talk about terms of like does it smell or taste like sort of flowers or sweet or like strawberries what's a good particular kind of pairing with normally if you have like that deep of a wine you probably want to go with something with a little bit more spicy sometimes a little bit more with fat on it but it all depends on like what t- taste because Particularly what I like to do with a blend is blend it together with other blends. They probably put in a little white wine and create like a really nice sangria with a little fresh fruit. You know? Blendception. Yeah. Ooh. I mean, hashtag blendception. Hashtag, hashtag blendception. Hashtag We're just blendception. turning out these viral uh, viral hashtags tonight. I mean, I, I didn't come up with it. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> But thanks for ha- thanks for coming up with us, man. I'm really excited to have you on there. A full part of the actual team, so you are still a crowd favorite. Um, and the last time I checked the ratings, somehow, some way, it was uh, at the bottom. It was me, and then after that, it was Jesse and Josh, and then Guillermo somehow was above me. And then <laughs> it goes Brylin, Blewett, Kyle, and then Moreno. So that was strange. Strange. I'm not sure exactly what happened there, but uh, interesting. You know, it's Guillermo's uh, accent. It wins him points every single time yeah i'm still kind of bummed that i'm the you know last minute out because i think i'm the most handsome but you know it's uh it's not surprising though based on based on all things that you'd be in last place okay well um, i'm gonna (laughs) i'm gonna leave that alone uh because i hurt my feelings a little bit and uh i'm gonna talk pairs nicely with salt yeah (laughs) (laughs) nice (laughs) uh nice thank you thank you for that 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 made me that made me chuckle um, but as far as what I've been watching and what I've been drinking, uh, my name is Warren. I'll be your host for this evening. Um, I basically am drinking right now. Actually, this is my last bottle of, um, it's a Blue Apron wine that I completely forgot about. It's just been hanging out and just, but it also comes in a very small bottle. So that's the, that's the largest bottle and one pour of wine. It's well over half of the bottle, which is not okay, which is still not, not bad, but um, we also will be celebrating the Wine Down Wednesday, so there you go for that, Marino. Uh, this guy here is a Chenin Blanc from Maurice Raoult. It's uh, 2005. Uh, it's just it's almost like close to like a Sauvignon Blanc, but not really. It's a bit sweeter. Um, this is actually from South Africa, which is pretty cool. Didn't realize that was from there. So a nice summer wine, very light, a little bit on the sweeter side, but sometimes the Sauvignon Blanc doesn't really have too much flavor. This does, so... Um, I do like this. I'm going to see if I can hopefully find not more something like this, but the Chenin Blanc, which I'm probably not pronouncing correctly. Ah, so sweet. Uh, it's pretty good. So I'm going to be sipping on that for this evening. As what I've been watching, I have, uh, I've been binging. I have been binging a lot. I watched one, two, three, four, five, six, seven episodes of, uh, Samurai Jack Season 5. <laughs> That's 140 minutes of action. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I watched it on my lunch. I woke up this morning, watched it on there. I watched one on my lunch break, and I just came home and just binged. Um, I'm really excited, so much so, because uh, me and Jesse actually talked about it for a little bit. 
Uh, I'm excited to talk about this show in depth um, because we can talk about seasons one through four is vastly different than season five. And because it's so new and it just ended, like the series actually just wrapped up last weekend, because it's so new, I know a lot of people probably hadn't had a chance to watch everything else before watching the series finale, so I'm definitely not going to spoil it because I don't even know. Uh, I'm just excited slash nervous. I'm excited because they did up the stakes, which is very interesting of... uh, kind of a comedic and kind of like i like the way they did a couple different things with the actual show itself but they definitely this is definitely not a kid's show anymore um Mm. at least at one point when you can see jack cutting robots in half that's okay because it's a robot um but they definitely change up that dynamic very graphically It, it it's very graphic so it's Um, a visual change not so much like a a conceptual like concept uh, well, change? it's also a concept change, too, um, because I think the one thing, the one main thing that Jack is battling is now something like physical, like not physical, but it's all emotional as well. Um, and it's something that he's actually kind of dealing with. Uh, but I'm just going to like, obviously, no spoilers from this point. Um, you know, I'll stop. I'll definitely stop talking. Something I would love to give it a little bit more time when I'm actually done with the entire series. Um, but I just I was shocked to see that this was still a, on a uh, TV show, like a Cartoon Network. Uh, and not something on like Adult Swim because I think it was still played on Toonami. So I, that's what we're. Doing. I wonder if they did that because the audience that grew up with Samurai Jack is now X amount of years older, and maybe they were just playing to the fan base that already existed instead of trying to make like a new. Because this is supposed to be like the end of the series, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's not like they cre- they're create they're starting a new run and that's going to be ongoing. Yeah. So maybe they're just trying to speak directly to the the, the fans at the, their appropriate age base. I now. Mean, it could be because I know it's twenty uh, two thousand seventeen for right now. And the show itself started back in two thousand three, I believe two thousand two. Um, so it's a huge gap, and obviously everybody who watched it from the kids of you know middle school, maybe uh, high school, middle school from that time, were definitely kind of grown up in that. But it it almost shocked me, and I have a, a higher appreciation for it. But then at the same time, I have a. Uh, I'm a bit nervous about you know kids watching some of this stuff because it's just it's still a cartoon. As much as we say a cartoon, people like kids are going to try to be addicted or at least not attracted. They're going to be attracted to watching cartoons. So um, that's all I gotta say about that. But Samurai Jack season five that's on I believe it's it's not on Hulu just yet. So I've been actually finding it on like kind of iTunes and on like Cartoon Network. You can stream some of the episodes. Um, so definitely go check that out. I'm also interested to see that if it is streamed on Cartoon Network, if they um, are showing everything, uh, and if they're not like censoring certain things. So that's something just to kind of keep in mind for for that. So mm. cool. Yeah. Dope. But thanks for everybody for hanging out as well. I'm super excited about this review of King Arthur by Guy Ritchie. What are your thoughts on just like the whole lore and the universe of King Arthur? I'll let you go first, Mike. I think you feel more passionately about King Arthur in general. So, uh, as a child, I just wanted to be a knight. I uh, like. I just like that was my biggest thing, and it's it's kind of it makes sense that I ended up falling in love truly with Star Wars because everyone wanted you know you wanted to be a Jedi knight. Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't want to be a scholar. I wasn't too smart for that. I didn't want to be some you know other things. I, that was cool. Uh, which is funny because now I work in IT and uh, slightly overweight and balding. And that's the furthest thing from a night you'll ever find. Slightly? Um, <laughs> you know, so I, it's – I love that stuff. I, I, I was thinking about this. Um, that apparently it doesn't exist because I couldn't find it on the Wikipedia page. But I remember there was this like – it was either PBS or like some other public access like television miniseries on King Arthur – that told a remarkably similar tale. Like it wasn't about the Holy Grail. It was one of the smaller, more about his family. Um, and I think it was more about the downfall of King Arthur rather than the start of it. So, but, but again, it wasn't high King Arthur and it, I loved it. I watched it every week. Um, I watched every documentary I could find on castles back in the day with obviously Camelot being like this mythical like big beast that they would reference every once in a while to make sure that the, the kiddos tuned in because it's public access. So I, I was like very excited uh, when I heard this movie was in the making. Uh, I pulled a Warren. I actually stuck through to my 
my guns of like not watching trailers. I didn't really read into the production cycle at all. Um, yeah, it was which was which was nice. I didn't even know who the main character really was because I like didn't I don't watch what was it Sons of Anarchy? Yeah, is that his big show? So I like I really didn't know his acting style at all. Which uh, that's ultimate spoiler alert. Just knowing nothing about that. Um, so I was really. I was really excited, and and I honestly can't say I was disappointed, which is a good thing. I, I thought out of watching all of those old PBS and Nova and whatever documentaries on this stuff, and seeing it being like overly dramatized, to see like a you know a different version of that character was was refreshing. So as far as you know, my experience with the King Arthur lore. I've oh I've been a fan of it from a general fantasy standpoint. Absolutely love like I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast. I'm a sucker for for swords and magic, um, so it doesn't take too much to really win me over. When I think back on the version of a King Arthur story that I really loved, especially as a kid, I think back to the Merlin miniseries, which I think was like a like NBC or CBS like three episode miniseries that happened way back in 1998. Um, and I loved that that show as a kid. It starred so the main character was Merlin himself. King Arthur wasn't the, the main character, but Merlin was played by Sam Neill, who you, oh. may, you guys may be more familiar of as oh. the uh, the protagonist in the original Jurassic Park. So this dude was Merlin, and this act this show actually had a really cool cast. Um, it had a young Helena Bonham Carter who Oof. played Morgan Le Fay. Uh, James Earl Jones was in it as the Mountain King. Martin Short was in it. Um, Lena Headey. A young Lena Headey was in it as, as uh, Guinevere. Lena Headey, who you may or may not know as Queen Cersei in Ooh, Game of Thrones. Get it. Uh, so it had a sick cast back in the day of people that would eventually become like major stars. Although back then Martin Shorts and Sam Neill and James Earl Jones were already pretty well known. Um, and it was campy. It was very much, you know, the graphics. I'm sure if I went back now and watched it, the graphics would look laughable and the story probably wasn't that great but i remember as a kid it had a lot of magic the main character was merlin and uh you know opposite of you mike i never wanted to be a knight i wanted to be a mage um i always thought magic was way was way cooler in that regard unfortunately mages tend to be portrayed as bad guys which i think they get a bad rap and they're portrayed as bad guys in this movie in uh, this new king arthur movie too but i still thought it was the coolest thing to be and so having that uh show with Merlin himself as the main character was a big win for, for little like twelve year old Michael. Nice, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm excited and kind of even kind of branching off of that. You did meet, mention one thing, and uh, Blue, you also had said something. Just looking for this is like no no spoilers, but something I did not realize, and I didn't realize I knew his uh, Charlie Hunnam's. I didn't realize I knew his acting style uh, as as well as I did. Because the top four sort of known for on his IMDb is Pacific Rim, Sons of Anarchy, Children of Men, and Green Street Hooligans. So, didn't realize he was even in that movie until I'm looking at the pictures. I was like, oh yeah, it's it's obvious that he's in this movie. He's like right there. So it's actually kind of wait, something pretty interesting. Wait, Charlie, Charlie Hunnam was in Children of Men? Yeah. Um, he was uh, Patrick. Oh wow, I don't remember that at all. Yeah. Yeah. So... Huh. That's good. I mean, going off it for me, um, much like what the Mocha was talking about, I'm a huge, huge fan of anything sort of video game sort of related. So if you give me like the the uh, the you know the fable sort of stories that talks about like being knights or being mages or choosing something else, you have the World of Warcraft or really anything that's in that video game sort of world. But you can, you can like either show me this or I can like at least jump on board and say this is very interesting. Um, I'm going to love anything about it. So I knew already going into this movie that it already had a bit of a step up because they were at least telling a story that I thought was interesting. Um, and I was I was also walking to this movie thinking it was going to be something like World of Warcraft or Warcraft movie, excuse me. Um, so I was also already going into like kind of nervous about it. But uh, yeah, so anything about kind of the King Arthur sort of story lore, my all my experiences really is going off of just one movie and that's The Sword in the Stone. And that is where it started for me. And really, I don't have, I don't know, um, you know, besides I'll talk about this movie later, but I don't know if I've ever seen any adaptation that was just so impactful because Merlin and, you know, Arthur were the main characters there. But Merlin was such a very comical character, almost like a, yeah, a more happy-go-lucky like Dumbledore, which is funny. Um, uh, and if, if you don't know that, that's uh, from Harry Potter. 
But uh, it's just very funny to see like this character Merlin, who's very comical, very hilarious. Like he's really down to earth. But then if you see his name in all the other literature and all the other movies we've seen, this is like this all-powerful being. Um, and, you know, King Arthur, Legend of the Sword, we also know that he is this all-powerful being also. So it's very interesting that they, it looks like they took that story and kind of flipped up and changed up a couple different things. But it's very interesting kind of going into this movie and we'll transition into winds of, you know, we all know the story of King Arthur. So... Is Guy Ritchie now going to talk about something different, or how is he going to pull in all the information that we currently know, and what new, what something fresh is he going to try to do, um, besides kind of changing the title, saying this King Arthur and the Legend of the Sword? I would say for right now, what we're going to do, we're going to go into our wins of King Arthur, Legend of the Sword. If you haven't necessarily seen the movie, just pause it for right now, go check it out, go watch it, then go ahead and pick it up and resume. We don't want to spoil this movie for you at all because it is it is a very interesting movie to definitely check out and watch as a summer uh, blockbuster. So, pause it, come on back, and we're going to start in a moment. Thanks. Um, so, I'm interested to hear about Mocha, you know, what are some wins that you got from this actual movie itself, or just overall kind of thoughts and feelings of King Arthur, Legend of the Sword? Yeah, absolutely. So, let's talk about the, the, the elephant in the room here, the absolute best thing about this movie. It doesn't matter which side of the fence you fall on, it's shirtless Charlie Hunnam. Uh, everybody loves it. That's absolutely. what everybody paid the money for the ticket to see, absolutely. let's be honest. Yeah. That one airboxing <laughs> scene. Yeah, I uh, I brought my I brought my binoculars and I've sat in the front row just because. So like, come on. Yeah, yeah. That uh that first scene where like he wakes up in bed after his after some dream and like it's sitting it's sitting down and it's just showing his back from behind um, was totally ripped off from Jon Snow in Game of Thrones. Yeah. They did that, that first. I can't remember another bristling back like shown in that exact fashion in cinema or TV. So I'm gonna give they, they did it twice too. They had him sit up. And then they did a scene, and then they had him sit up again for the next day just to show his back again. I well, was like, his contract hey. now. He needs at least two rippling back scenes per movie. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you got a back that good, like you know, you might as well. You might as yeah, well. right. Bought <laughs> it if you got it. If you got a back uh, that good, I mean. <laughs> but yeah, but uh, beefcake pen dragon aside, um, I think that the. You know, one of the, my favorite things about this movie was the fact that it was absolutely just dripping with Guy Ritchie's signature style. You could not sit through this movie and not become aware that it was a Guy Ritchie flick at any point. It just screamed him. Um, and I think it played off really well, you know. The um, King Arthur, as we've seen through the list and through our own discussions about different versions of the story that we've experienced, is a story that we've heard retell a lot of times uh, over the past few decades. And Guy Ritchie's approach to to film and directing can freshen up even like the most stale story. So you know, I was just really happy to get another Guy Ritchie flick in general. In general, um, it was really just visually exciting. The it had this kinetic energy that ran throughout, even during scenes that were calm and relatively peaceful. Um, that just had me excited on the edge of my seat the entire time. Um, and as for Charlie Hunnam too, you know, he didn't. He didn't do anything particularly amazing with his acting. He was Charlie Hunnam in a lot of his, like in a lot of the same ways that he is, like or in lots of similar ways as he was in Pacific Rim or in Sons of Anarchy. But that was exactly what this film needed. I think I don't think he needed to do anything more than what he did. Um, I think he was a really good fit for uh, playing this role under the the direction of Guy Ritchie. Um, I mentioned earlier that I am a sucker for fantasy warfare. Um, especially, you know, anything with swords and, and bows and arrows and magic and giant beasts and sieging of castles is going to make me happy. And this movie had all of that. Um, the thing opens up with a, a siege of Camelot where these absolutely gigantic war elephants are trundling their way, knocking over bridges. And there's, they're carrying these huge backpacks uh, that are just filled with deployable troops. And it was just like really exciting to see well, it's just just there to, to just be pure fan service fantasy action. Uh, that's all I really needed. That yeah. alone made me happy. But it continued throughout the movie, which was which was great. Um, and also, you know, speaking to those elephant creatures, the creature gallery in this film was pretty cool. In general, the elephants were were really interesting. I got a really big kick out of their approach to what could have been like mermaids or sirens. They were these three sisters who had octopus bodies, 
um, at least the lower halves of their bodies were all tentacles, and they sort of they show up initially as this writhing mass of slimy tentacles, and they sort of unfurl their upper torsos from each as they speak in tempting, whispering tones to Jude Law's character. And I thought visually it looked amazing and was a really cool take on the whole notion of a siren and or a mermaid. They were super creepy, um, and I, I loved it. I thought that you know the creature gallery was great in this film. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a lot of the wins for this movie were just hitting those like nerdy sweet spots for me um, overall. I really, I'm really, really glad that you actually talked about that because I really, they, they already introduced a lot of mythical beings and characters, but the fact that now they're talking about these characters that we're kind of used to in King Arthur, um, but now we're even branching off of like the Odysseus, right? Or like the, these stories in which we still know something about, but now we're start seeing more and more, almost like kind of like a Beowulf, but not quite, but we're introduced to other weird, different, like, creatures and characters of like exactly like what to happen and they, they only did it once he may have done it another time i gotta th- rethink of the other one but uh i thought that was very interesting of the having that particular kind of siren mermaid character oh the the lady in the water sort of a character also of like the yeah you have the goddess of the sea sort of thing and um i thought that was also very interesting of they they really t- really was pulling in more and more information but Realistically, I think all the other stories came from this, so I thought it was pretty cool. Well, they did. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of an interesting take where they had the whole like other dimension, which they didn't really explore a ton, which I was fine with. Um, but they they took it out of. I felt like a lot of Arthurian magic was based on like the metaphysical, you know, and it, it was just like kind of co- like conjuring stuff rather than different dimensions or or uh, other ways that we've seen magic been portrayed in media. And so I thought it was kind of interesting where they took that and said, oh, there is this other dimension where they can draw power from and also draw beings from. And uh, the Dark Place was a great example, summoning the elephants and having them crash through the mountain to get to the other. Like literally breaking from one dimension to the other was a really, really cool visual to see. So you're absolutely yeah. right. Like the the creature design was amazing in this, and yeah, the it, it was cool. It it was just, it was just a you know a delight. It was visually stunning. It was gorgeous. And when you when you add to that the frenetic uh, nature of Guy Ritchie telling any kind of story, it just created this um, just a really fun summertime film. Like this is a good movie to kick off summer with. It's not going to win an Academy Award um, for anything, except for maybe Best Bod, Charlie Hunnam. But I think that as is like a popcorn flick to start the summer movie season, blockbuster movie season, um, it was a great, great way to kick it all off. Uh, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with you, Mocha, for a lot of your wins. Uh, Blue, what you got? So, um, I'm a huge Arthur fan, and I feel like a lot of the previous things I've seen... PBS Arthur? Uh, yeah, this apparently the show that never happened. Um so I really loved seeing the origin story again um, because I think out of all the tales they tell, they usually – it's either like a full fast forward through the entire legend or it's just the Holy Grail or it's just the end where like the whole half-sister, the half-brother like kind of thing comes into play. And so I think that out of everything I've ever seen – him pulling the sword from the stone gets glossed over the most. It's one scene, and then you're on to the next thing. So seeing a fully developed movie based around that concept was was really cool. Um, I also really, I think Mocha had touched on this before, I really loved the editing style. The explanation scenes were like near Ant-Man good in terms of like when they were talking about different, uh, like the backstory when the original guy was like... Um, before it even really started, and he was talking about while his interactions with the Vikings uh, and the way that they cut back and forth between every character and they were kind of like messing with each other was hilarious and just so very, very English. Um, and that was that was a huge, huge win because, again, like you're used to these stiff like this is King Arthur. This is very this is a important tale. and It's a tale as old as time. And uh, they go start singing and dancing after that. Um, and seeing it told in a very cheeky way was 
awesome. Um, I guess to expand on the first point, I think that one of the big wins for me was that they didn't introduce everyone. There was no Morgan Le Fay. There was no Mer- well, Merlin was in that one scene that they smartly, you know, covered his face to recast him later. Nice. And then there and there was no Lancelot. And so, like, you have these three huge heavy hitters in Arthurian legend that they didn't touch on once. And I think it forced. There's this concept in a lot of things where you establish guidelines for yourself and you are not allowed to go outside of those guidelines. And then you have to be creative within a limited, like a limited set. And so that's what they did. They took Guinevere, they took uh, Arthur, they took Vortigrin and they said, all right, what's the story that you can tell with these three people, you know, and you can, you can like touch on Uther, but like you can't really tell his story. Mm-hmm. And so I thought that the limited people they could work with really, in fact, helped establish the characters better and helped develop the storyline better because they didn't have to tell too much in one tale. Um, I think my biggest win, honestly, and this goes, we kind of touched on it earlier when talking about Mocha's like thing for, you know, these, these epic fantasies. This was by far the greatest video game movie I've ever watched in my entire life, which isn't saying much uh, because I don't think that they, there really is like a, a standout video game movie. Like it's not the Super Mario Brothers movie no. for sure. No. It was the best video game movie. And it's not even based on a video game, which is crazy. If you look at I played about two hours worth worth of this movie called uh, not movie, uh, video game called The Witcher. Uh, the Witcher 3, for example. And they literally uh, one of the factions had a god king, the faction dressed in all black. And they, um, it was medieval set. Uh, it was, I think, Scandinavia based, not English based, but mm. medieval. Um, your character plays as this weird hybrid of uh, half warrior, half mage. So obviously, they split that category into two. You know, they had uh, Arthur and Guinevere, but it was still present. Where it's like the mystics were kind of shunned by society but we're still kind of there. And so it really, it played, so it had the setting of that. Um, It also played up like a a video game where you start off and you have a very weak, you know, set of weapons. You have literally your fists and that's what the first couple fight scenes were. And then you go up and then you have like, you train with the weapon, but you can't use it for some whatever reason. So it's like, you know, there's a block there. Um, You recruit party members. (laughs) Yeah, 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 exactly. You kind of, they they come and go. You have the one scene I actually liked. I hated it at first when I saw that one scene where he uses the sword and then it flashes back to him and everyone's dead around him. And you're like, oh man, I didn't get to see the sword in action. Like that stinks. And then when they finally show you about 30 minutes later, like where he just wrecks everyone in that training uh, facility and like that, oh no, no, excuse me, where he wrecks everyone at the castle and they actually show him hitting everyone. It, the payoff was that much better because they didn't show him wrecking everyone in the training facility. And again, I thought that was very video game ish where like there was these things where like you don't get the full weapon set capability, you get them later on in the game. Um, even the end fight scene with the boss was very reminiscent of a Dark Souls uh, fight scene, yeah. where it's like yeah, one on one with this like overarching monster. There's not much dialogue until like little certain points, and it really seems like an impossible odds. Uh, it seemed very, very like Dark Souls in that that you know spot. Uh, even like the whole combos to beat him almost felt like you could see the little buttons like God of War, yes, where like yes. they you know like there's a little cutscene and it says press A now, tap B now, like you could almost see the buttons popping up. And I didn't think that was a bad thing. I thought that was really cool. Like I love those cinemagraphics where you you're part of the action ish. But not really. Like you're kind of letting the console drive the rest of the experience, and I, I, I like those. I think they. I mean, clearly those games make a lot of money. You know, like clearly a lot of people share those sentiments, and it was a very. They did it well in a movie that I wasn't expecting that to come out of. Nice. Yeah, I like that point about it. Be, feel like a video game. I 
somehow I didn't make that connection when I was watching it, but all of your points were pretty were were pretty accurate. I think it definitely did feel like a well executed video game movie, oh, for which sure. we've never seen before. Like they just for some reason they can't figure that one out. Well, it's probably I, because this is this isn't a video game movie. It's probably a video <laughs> game based, a movie based on a video game. It's just a movie to, made to feel like a video game. But every video game that talks about this is all based on King Arthur, or at least it's, it's all based on this particular lore or universe or this story. Uh, especially when I was talking about kind of fable in particular, like that. Uh, you, you look at that. You look at uh, World of Warcraft. You look at Skyrim. Like. No, there's going to be a quest in which case you're going to be with somebody to find a blade, that, to find a special sword. Like, uh, they are obviously... Legend of you know, Zelda? Yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I, was gonna say the whole, that was, I was just going to say, literally the Master Sword. Yeah. Pulls it out of a rock and everything. Yeah, and just like the Master Ball in Pokemon. So it's literally... Uh, it's all... It's all... <laughs> sorry, I had to sprinkle that in there again. Uh, I mean, it's all related. Um... That's very unfortunate. It's very sad. But, uh, you know, going into um, like a bit of my wins here, um, the biggest thing was the video game portion of it because I love playing the games that let you level up. But you, you, you don't quite have to do like a band of team, but leveling up and do like special moves and doing all that stuff of that scene that uh, Mike was talking about. Like, first of all, the entire thing of um, Guy Ritchie's version of doing montages um, I think was very impactful. It's very interesting. At least is a very different way of doing it because he has a lot of cut scenes that's on top of each other almost. And you know the last few movies I've seen of him were the both of the Sherlock Holmes movies with um, Robert Downey Jr. and then The Man from Uncle. Um, he does this weird thing that he like sec- he used to normally like, section off the entire screens. So you can see more stuff that's actually happening and. A lot of information is being processed really quickly, but also these scenes are happening almost at the same time so that you can get more of a story quickly without boring people to death and talk about more exposition. So I like how they really, when they went to the other dimension, that that was very, very accelerated of that. So I, I do appreciate that. The fact that it was a video game, I mean, I literally got chills during the part where in the scene, and the only way that he finally has a chance to kind of control some of the power or of the actual blade, where he puts his two hands on the sword and it's like he's just blacked out. And I would have, I would have absolutely loved it. Even either way worked for me. But if he had that scene, he puts his two hands on the sword and it opens his eyes and all the stuff is done and like you don't see any of the stuff that happened because we see some stuff, right? But he just opens his eyes and you just see it and you'd be like, okay. Now I'm really excited to see exactly what happens with that. That was uh, very, very impactful. I was super excited about that. Um, you know, another one of my wins, I'm looking at this for right now, and this is much what uh, Moreno had just talked about, was, you know, this is what really the Warcraft movie should have been, or at least more along the lines of this. Um, you know, but digging, you, you still can actually make it work. I was just kind of really digging this movie of just some of the characters, and like even the characters that... It knew it was a nod, and I, I'm pretty sure Guy Ritchie knew that, hey, we're going to put Littlefinger in this movie, and he's going to be a person that knows a lot of information. So <laughs> I thought that was very funny. I was like, oh, I mean, that has to be a nod of Game of Thrones lovers, right? All right, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, so, I mean, I liked it. I liked for that particular fact. I liked the dialogue. I liked the wittiness of, you know, Charlie Hunnam's character of uh, Arthur. Um, I like that they had a character that wasn't quite Robert Downey doing the same sort of dialogue as Sherlock Holmes did in that movie. So I thought that was uh, very impactful and very interesting to watch and just to see, especially the banter of, you know, that storytelling, much as you were talking about Blue It, of, hey, just tell me what happened and tell me what happened from the beginning. And literally, just like Snatch. Or, you know, just like Lockstock, they go down and say about 50 different names, and you see the character of the face, and you see that, and it just goes ties and ties and ties together. And somebody mentions something else, then you have a separate one that goes in. Like, the way that Guy Ritchie has a chance to kind of weave um, all these different characters in place to talk about a very funny story, a very interesting story, then you also get, like, small clips and, like, t- uh, tidbits of information. Um, it's, it's just a very good way. I'm not entirely sure. I know there's like, a style for that. Um, but I thought it was very impactful. Uh, yeah, so, I haven't yeah. seen I haven't seen The Man from Uncle, so I might be mistaken. But I feel like this movie was the the most like Snatch, or the most like or the closest in style to Snatch that Guy Ritchie has done since Snatch itself. Um, in terms of like a lot of that really intense 
quick cuts, a lot of information yeah. in a brief amount of time, um, almost a comical approach to barreling over the audience's uh, senses until they're just like inundated with it. The one thing, the only difference between that, uh, between like, for instance, we're talking about Snatch and Man from Uncle, is that Snatch was. I think it added a, a huge other element of comedic performance because we had a narrator in the Man from Uncle we didn't. So we actually just saw it actually happen as it actually goes. Both are hilarious, good movies. I, I really enjoy both of them. Um, but I, I, I definitely see, I literally saw an element in all his other movies he had in this movie. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah. So That's a one last thing on that one, I, I I kind of forgot about this during my wins. Uh, the but you touched on it. The near lo- non linear storytelling was really cool. Where like it wasn't quite out of sequence, but it was out of sequence. Like the scenes all flowed together uh, chronologically, mm-hmm. but the subsections to the scenes didn't. And that was really cool. I, I hadn't seen that. I don't think in a movie. Like usually it's all over the place or it's pretty rigid um they played with that timeline just enough that it was like pretty new they had to actually think a little bit about like oh when is this happening yeah Yeah. i feel like they showed us uh you know the story chronologically but they didn't give us all the information chronologically so like it's near the end of the movie when we get to go back and find out that uh you know what led up to the scene where uther pendragon jumps inside that uh siege elephant and beheads mortigan uh, I believe it was Mordigan that he beheaded in that scene. Mm-hmm. Um, or, you know... Mordred, like Mordred. So, Mordred, excuse me. Yeah. yeah. Or, like like you said, the scene with the Vikings. You know, we're, we, we, we're told what happens in the scene with the Vikings, and then we get to re-see how it actually happened through the lens of Charlie Hunnam's character lying about how, how it actually happened. So this is lit... Like, those two things you guys just talk about are two exact... I think this is a Guy Ritchie-specific thing because, spoiler alert for Snatch, and I'm not going to talk about the other one. So, spoiler spoiler alert for Snatch, he does this of, like, he tells the story literally, like, linear, um, right? And then you talk about the fact that, you know, all the Pikeys are setting up a trap, and then after it happens, then you go back and you find out all the other information that's happened from before, then you cut back to the actual present, and then you know that, oh... Like that, the shotgun to the face was like killing those people, and then they drive off. So he's done this in uh, he's done this in a lot of his movies of the both of the actual Sherlock Holmes too. Uh, but it's a very effective way, I think, it's a very effective way to keep like a shroud over the audience or just distract the audience with other stuff and not try to focus on the main story up until the time that he wants you to look at and focus on the main story. So I, I, yeah. think, I, I like it. I think it's effective storytelling. What, one more thing. I, so, I mean, I feel like we've been for what? Has it been a full year or two years? A year and a half since uh, Batman versus Superman came out. Um, and <laughs> that, so one of the things I last, absolutely that was hated. Even, that was almost, it wasn't even almost a year. I'm, just letting you know. No, because it came out before Civil War. And so I think Civil War was about a year ago. Oh. So... One of the things I absolutely hated was the fact that they showed the parents getting killed um, in that movie. And they kept on coming back to it, you know, like over and over, but like kind of showing the same scene. And I have to say that this movie did it right, where like they kept on jumping back to the Uther, like, you know, sacrifice scene. But they kept on showing a little bit more and and it the more they showed developed with uh, Hunnam's Arthur character. So yeah. they were they were together like you, you it was nonlinear that you you didn't see the full scene and then it cut forward and you saw a full scene. It felt natural where both characters or excuse me both the character and what they showed in the scene progressed together. Yeah. And I thought it was really effective. It was the same style of storytelling. Just one was done very well and inventive and the other wasn't yeah it showed you what you needed to see in order to accept it without too many questions right um, and to make sense of the story around it but every time it went back it gave you it gave more to the scene that just made everything about it that much cooler and it didn't bludgeon you over the head with just repetitiveness right yeah um batman vs superman dawn of justice came out march 20th last year so kind of think about that um, the other thing that I, I want to actually mention as we transition to a bit of a criticisms, and I'm not going to start, but I do want to at least kind of touch on a point, Blue, that you just made because it's fresh in everybody's heads, 
was one of the things that didn't work for me, and I'm not sure if it was a kind of a cutting thing, um, but I wanted, I guess, a little bit more mystery of how um, Arthur Pendragon actually died or who killed him, right? And in the in the scene of when he goes to like the alternate dimension and he goes through all these trials and stuff like that, we see as the audience that it's Jude Law. And I guess I was confused. I guess going into the entire story of he did it. It felt like at least his actions. It felt like he didn't know who killed his father, or he didn't know that Jude Law had killed his father. But us of the audience can sit there and says, "Well, we saw this. So why why are we confused? You didn't look away. What's going on?" Um, so, but yeah, Mike, what you got? Two two things on that. The first one, uh, I. I wasn't confused on who ordered the hit. I was confused on whether it was Jude Law himself or something he summoned up, because up, I don't think they win. ever showed the transformation. So I I agreed who pulled the, you know, who inevitably pulled the trigger. I just didn't know if that they were going to introduce someone else in that role as that beast. The other thing is that I'd say they did a very good job of um really driving the point home that he was a very small child and they really drove the point home that it was a repressed memory that he forgot rather than, um, you know, any sort of like lack of memory. Um, and I think that they, you know, this isn't necessarily the film that goes into repressed memories and childhood, uh, trauma, you know, it's, it's not the place for it. Uh, but I think they did a pretty good job on recognizing that that happens and incorporating it into this, the, the movie. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm all on board with uh, the – I'm not all on board with repressed memories. I'm just going to throw that out there. But I'm all on board War- with – Warren <laughs> Jackson. What do you like, <laughs> drama enthusiast? Uh, I'm all on board with them and how they at least – explored the idea that you know a, a being like this who now we talked about this before i don't think in this entire uh, any of these actual works that we had from before at least i've seen or my experience with it that they've ever talked about the scenario of king arthur has repressed memories of his father or, or repressed memories at, at all like repression was not a thing that was even mentioned or talked about so I thought that was another, you know, going back to our wins, I thought it was a huge point. I'm glad that they at least went there. I'm glad that they're at least making these characters seem more human, although they're um, extraordinary characters. That makes it seem a little bit more believable. I know we're watching fiction. Everybody knows we're watching fiction. But if you can take these fiction characters and for a moment make them feel more vulnerable and more human, of saying, that, oh, I could kind of be this fictional character. I think that's another way, just uh, effective storytelling or effective writing, at least, of how to make characters more believable. My issue is, uh, Bluey, going off of your last point before we move on, when did you find out, or when did it click in your head of, oh, that character is literally Jude Law? I think the, honestly, it was pretty late. I'm yeah. not, I'm not going to like, like there's some stuff that will be like, yeah, I saw that early. Yeah. Um, Mocha, what you got? It was pretty late though. Yeah, so I, um, I'm usually pretty good at, sensing things early in movies my mind kind of works over time whenever like against my will when i'm when i'm watching something that has a mystery in it but i actually didn't see that coming at all um and i think i think i was just really invested in the idea of the black knight being another one of the creatures like you know mm-hmm. the movie starts off with uther and the kingdom of camelot fighting against a you know a h- hordes of giant beast controlled by mages and then we find out that Uther's brother like performs a, a ritual sacrifice to get some weird power that we don't know about from similar creepy creatures yeah. so when i first saw the black knight i just assumed that oh that's what that was summoned by him killing his wife um i never actually put it together that oh the power that he gained transformed him into this demon knight uh, so I actually was caught off guard by it and I, was pleasantly surprised. I didn't recognize that it was even a mystery. I just accepted it as fact. Yep, yeah. here's the Black Knight doing what the Black Knight does, it, killing the family. The, I guess the, the reason why I brought it up in criticisms, because I'm, I'm on board with exactly what both of you guys said. The thing that took me out of it was when he went to the other dimension and they showed, they, they literally show him transform from the Black Knight 
to um, Jude Law's character. His name's uh, like leaving me. For Fortigan. Me. Fortigan. 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 So he they show that transformation, and so that's when I was like, well, why would you show that? I, I'm confused. And they show it as if we're the audience that we should know this information that early on because that happens within the first what three yeah probably like 45 50 minutes uh, this movie is over two hours um so i thought it was very strange that that was so soon um that it was that that they introduced that character of what what not what is this black knight but there is this mysterious black knight i was like that's awesome i'm on board of we have other beings in this actual world but then they kind of debunk anything that was happening because they show you that he transforms into back into Lodigan. So that was, uh, I was kind of a bum uh, at that point. I was hoping that he can just cut that out completely or just, cause we see the entire scene play out later on and we see exactly what's happening. And, you know, Uther um, knows that it's his brother this entire time. So that, I thought that was a very impactful scene at the end so I'm not entirely sure why they even had that scene drag on for so long earlier, was my uh, thing. There was one thing that we actually didn't talk about, and if we did, I have actually missed it. But that's something I was thought was very, very interesting. A complete different way, uh, but the fact that the literal stone is the body of his father. Did we talk about that? We did it, and that was pretty cool. Yeah, like, when, uh, and for a bit more context as well, we see that uh, near the end of the movie, I believe, actually, no, we see this earlier, we see this earlier in the movie. That, about midway through. Yeah, about midway through, when uh, uh, Uther is, uh, what's his name again, Moreno? Uther Pendragon. Uther Pendragon. Yeah. yeah, love that name. He well, so he, badass. He, he, he like he's trying to defeat this weird sort of shadowy beast, and he know he fails. So he has this weird, pretty cool stylized way of like he throws up the actual sword, um, and it goes like in his actual spine itself, like right down, and he actually turns into the actual stone and sinks to the bottom of the uh the sea. Um, which is a great way of showing why the lady of the sea, who was the like the previous owner of the actual sword, like lowered the actual tide so that they can actually reveal that's where it actually is. And I thought that was a very interesting kind of way of to do a storytelling um, of that. It just kind of clicked in my head of like that's that's kind of dark that you're telling me you're literally avenging your father. By pulling something out that he kind of given to you when he when you're ready, so I thought that was pretty cool for that part. Yeah, yeah, another great example of Guy Ritchie's really really cool storytelling style. Yeah, for sure. yeah, I don't remember that from original like legend that he like he literally sac he knew that the blade would fall into the wrong hands, so he sacrificed himself to make sure that that thing couldn't go anywhere. Yeah, was, and it adds a little bit of credence cool. to the whole notion of of Arthur being the chosen one. It wasn't so much that you know the sword chose him; it was that his father's spell broke when his his son came back to claim mm. the sword. Yeah, mm. which is cool. And I really like the fact that you see um, again another <laughs> going back to wins, but the fact that you know you see Uther Pendragon Dragon like use the two hand sword and completely just slashes with it. And now, because he's passed, he, he's died, he's given his son more power, and uh, Jude Law's character has now bestowed this even more power into King Arthur to actually overthrow him. That's why he has even like even more power, and that's what's pretty, pretty cool. But uh, Yeah, yeah I, have one, I have one more win that I was kind of thinking about. So, because it was so stylized and not like a by-the-book thing, I'm... Um, I'm fairly happy that they, they had a diverse cast. You know, when yeah. we talk about, like, I'm usually on the other side of things that I'm like, all right, well, yeah, if they're trying to do something historical, like, you know, let's keep it, I guess, to this. Or, like, I'm not really fielding the the kind of justice people that are like, well, we have to introduce, like, this forced diversity for no reason's sake. But under highly stylized version of this tale – yeah, why can't we have, like, a Black Knight in England in the 1300s? You know, like, that. that's awesome. That was really cool. Yeah, we had Martin Lawrence. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, what's his name? Uh, Bertigrin? Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, who who's a great, oh Bedivere. A Bedivere, Bedivere. Bedivere. Sorry. Played uh, by G. Mon Hanso, who he is was great. He was fantastic. amazing in that. Um, you also had you had an Asian uh, knight as well, which <laughs> again it was it's not like the most diverse cast in the entire like world it wasn't like it was every single minority was there but like for a movie that's supposed to take place in middle ages like the whitest country of all time cool they, they threw a couple a couple minority actors in there and i i really appreciate it because i felt like there was a different style that was brought to that role especially where um the gentleman they got to play sir george tom Wu is a legit wushu master which I'm looking this up right now, and like to be able to see, you know, traditionally you got like the the knights in shining armor with their big long swords and lances, and here's some guy that does Asian mar- martial arts. That's a really cool twist that I think they can expand on. Oh. Um, that leads me right into my criticisms uh, because right now, as it stands, this is 2017's version of 300. It was a highly stylized. Not the greatest story in the world, but highly stylized version of a historical event. Um, I think that the the uh, like the effects at this point, like they even did the slow mo thing, you know, whereas that's like Zack Snyder's like coup de grace is, is using slow mo. Um, I, I think that in the long run, I mean, when when's the last time you watched Three Hundred? The replayability on that movie is pretty low. Um, <laughs> I agree. I disagree, but we can we can talk about that. That's 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 fair. I, I probably haven't rewatched it. I watched none of the sequels because they all just looked like the exact same thing. And granted, I liked Three Hundred when it first came out. I thought it was this really cool film. I thought that it was it was like new and, re- and like refreshing for its day. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I take this under the fact that a lot of media. Um, I know music the best probably out of all the different medias, um, but like film, literature, literature, any sort of visual, like it all goes in, it's a cyclical thing. And so are we now in this time when we're just going to get a bunch of highly stylized films a la 10 years ago? Um, And so that's my one concern that I, I think that this movie needs a sequel to prove its worth. I think that they really, like my biggest thing was like, I just thought the character motivations were kind of goofy. Like Arthur was kind of like all up to one point. And then, then he had that one scene where they were sitting in the woods and he's like, yeah, this is how I'm going to convince it. And they're like, we didn't even know you wanted to do this. Never mind, had a plan. And so in its own, I liked them. I, I liked the movie. I even liked that scene because it was kind of funny. It was very guy. The guy Pierce directed it very well. Um, okay, Richie. Uh, Guy Ritchie, sorry. Guy Pierce was in Alien. Uh, (laughs) It's it's all these guys, you know, surrounded by guys. Um, I think that, like, they they need to have a successful sequel to make this movie make sense and to make every character work in this movie. Mm -hmm. Um, If they do not have a sequel, which I'm guessing they're going to do. I mean, they didn't really do... It, It tanked to the box office, dude. I know, I know, but like... Yeah, but they already had signed on for the sequel, and they potentially could have signed on for more, because this is going to be opening up for a potential trilogy to talk yeah. about the different... the Just the different components yeah. of the story. I guess they do, they do Holy Grail as a standalone, and then they do his death as a standalone. Yeah. But Yeah, I mean, they clearly want to make it into a franchise, but, I mean, we'll see... You know, they may have signed on, but if the numbers don't pick up in terms of their international sales, yeah. the the studio isn't going to do a second movie. Well, they they might they might do exactly what they did with Three Hundred, where they they greenlight the sequel and then gut the cast, gut the writing, and then you get this garbage that it doesn't matter. You know, like but, like. But the difference there is that Three Hundred did gangbusters in the box office. That's true. That's true. I I mean, yeah, I don't know what happened there. Some they I don't know what happened with the sequel to Three Hundred, but. Uh, wasn't that good I watched no, it no I know I know but the uh, but with this like they almost need that movie to make this one make a little bit more sense and to make sure that it's not just this stylized King Arthur retelling that only works you know for a quick buck that they, apparently they're not making so the other thing is uh, I know I said this before that like this directly contradicts me but I would have loved to seen a little bit more of a tease for Marilyn. 
Like they didn't even tease him. They basically said he exists. Yeah. And so they didn't like, I would have loved to have seen more of that side and seen a little bit more of just like what good magic can do rather than just Guinevere. Uh, Mocha, what about your uh, criticisms? What you got? Yeah, so, you know, I mentioned this before that I'm I'm really a sucker for these type of movies and it doesn't have to be good for me to enjoy it. I enjoyed this movie a lot, but I don't think it was that great overall. Um, there were a lot of elements about it that I liked. But, you know, one thing, and some of these things may be a bit more personal, but I'm kind of over King Arthur films. Um, I know that there, you have a soft spot in your heart for them, Mike, and it's a great classic story for a reason. But, you know, Warren, when you went through that list earlier, we had movies going back to the 19, what was it, like 1960s? 1950s, 50s? yeah. Like, I'm, I'm over King Arthur. I don't need to see more movies about him. But more importantly, I don't need to see Guy Ritchie who does not come with come out with films so very often to do a King Arthur film. I would have been ecstatic if this was an original fantasy warfare IP done by Guy Ritchie. I would have loved to see him take his talent, his directing style, and put it towards original characters with a, with a new story. Um, that That's what would have made it happy for me. I don't really need more King Arthur. Um, and so the fact that you know the King Arthur tale itself is a little long in the tooth is a criticism. Even though this was a really unique telling of that story, I'll give it that. This was the most unique version of King Arthur we've seen, and I think it executed itself well for what it could do. But so I would have rather have seen him do something with original characters. Um, in addition, I and I talked about this a little bit during the Alien Covenant pod, but you know, if you're going to have secondary characters that don't have a major impact on the film, don't just hire big name actors just so that they're there in the credits. You know. Um, I thought this was a relatively boring role for Jude Law, who is an absolutely phenomenal actor. Um, I think that all the extra characters uh, that were in it, you know, Jimon Hanso is fine. He's a character actor. But having, um, what's his name? Littlefinger. I'm trying to think of his actual, like, his actual name as an actor in here was a distraction. Like, I saw him and all I saw was Littlefinger. A- a- and his- Aiden Gillian. Aiden Gillian, yeah. Yeah, and, and all they did was shave his goatee. That's it. <laughs> yeah, his voice, his demeanor, his behavior was pretty much Littlefinger, and that's boring. Like, come on, give me someone, give someone else a shot, bring some no name in there who can, you know, kill the role, and let you know. Don't put Aiden Gillen into this. Don't put Aiden Gillen in the corner. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, I I love Jude Law in this. I thought he was for Jude Law like weirdly imposing. I thought he did a good good job with it. Yeah, he wasn't bad. Like, Jude Law is a fantastic actor. But I just thought it was a boring role for Jude Law. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. That, maybe that's, you know, that's controversial. But I just feel like, you know, the, the main character is where, you know, the main character was Charlie Hunnam. Um, and even Eric Bana. I was happy to see him in that role for, you know, the amount of time he had on screen. But I would have taken, you know, a lot of different actors or at least, our, you know, a, a different group of, of actors in the rest of the film would have been less distracting for me. Um, I felt like the the scene which you mentioned, Mike, the scene where Arthur grabs a sword near the end and goes freaking like Super Saiyan on everybody around him and slashes everybody up. Super cool conceptually, but visually was extremely awkward. It was so obvious that it was entirely CG. Um, and it seemed like they were trying to overcompensate by the fact that he looked like a plastic Barbie doll version of Charlie Hunnam by moving the camera all, all around a lot. But any time where the character slowed down even a little bit, it was it was very very clearly shiny plastic CGI. And like what should have been a badass scene was kind of jokey for me because of that. Um, and again, like you know, like I liked it. I thought it was cool. But I couldn't help but just be painfully aware of how suddenly CGI it was when the rest of the CGI in the film, like for the uh, octopus sirens, for the elephants, for any of the other graphics that were done, were all really good and well blended in with the environments. Um, I felt like that just stuck out as like a sore thumb. Well, the CG kind of made it, the poor CGI kind of made it feel more video game ish. Because mm-hmm. it was, it felt like it was getting rendered on a console rather than rendered on a supercomputer in a, you know, in a lab somewhere. Um, yeah. The other thing is that I, I agree with you on this. That I think 
CG will look bad. It doesn't matter when it is, it will eventually look bad because it's it's not real. And so I think that you have to get it out a certain point to where the fact is that, what, almost 30 years later, we're all talking about Jurassic Park looks amazing still. You have to get it so good that it takes so long to overcome that, that there's no, like, this looks bad. It just flips into wow, remember how good this was when it came out. Um, right. And this movie will not have that. This will have a. This will never reach that period where it was so good when it came out. It will go from, this is mediocre, to, wow, this looks terrible. I can't mm-hmm. believe that we accepted this five years ago. Yeah. The final little piece of criticism, and this is very much a personal thing. Please let me know if you guys have ever noticed this, because it, it cracks me up every time. But Charlie Charlie Hunnam, God love him, has the stupidest angry face in the world. <laughs> Anytime this man is angry, he just looks like a complete oaf. Um, he does this face where audience can't see it at home, but I'll tweet something later where his like lips are pressed together and his eyes are open and his eyebrows are furrowed. And it's just it's goofy. And you see it in Pacific Rim. You see it in Sons of Anarchy. And there's a scene in this movie, too, where I think he's talking to Jude Law's character, and he says something mean to him, and the camera pans to just Charlie Hunnam, and he's making that stupid, dumbass, angry face again. And it just makes me... It cracks me up every time. I'm going to have to tweet this, because you guys need to see just how dumb this face looks. Once you see it, you'll never be able to unsee it. A buddy of mine pointed it out to me, and I can't not see it every time I see a movie. Um... <laughs> So, like, you know, <laughs> that's a, that's going to be a criticism every time because no matter when I see that dumb, angry face, it makes me laugh and breaks whatever tension is in the moment at the time. Um, but, yeah, I mean, overall, those criticisms, I feel like for this movie in particular, a lot of those criticisms were much more personal as opposed to being outright, I think this was a, you know, poor direction or poor acting or whatever. Um, but, you know, again, I think this is one of those movies where I only enjoyed it because I'm such a sucker for the type of film it is. Yeah. I mean, even kind of going to my criticisms, like, I I know that I, I think we all have been more critical in other movies that we may think that this movie is better, but maybe not. But we have a lot more biases to this movie, and that's definitely not fair. But neither is life, so get over it. Um, so I was... Going into this movie, I already knew that it was it was a step up of I'm gonna like whatever that it is because A is Guy Ritchie and B has to talk about you know medieval times. So give me something with that. Um, but you know, moving into my criticisms, uh, much like Moreno was talking about, it was really difficult to not only look past other kind of star or um, high profile actors who already are in more work, but it's very difficult to get past all the uh, Game of Thrones characters um that's in the actual movie itself and i'm like that person the game of thrones that person the game of Thrones, that person game of thrones like i thought for sure ned stark was gonna pop up at some point what clicked in my mind is oh after they died that's why they're in this movie right or a oh that's weird they're still in this movie um, i wonder if we're gonna see his character back with like a full a shaved mustache or stuff like that in the next episodes who knows but that kind of bothered me just because they're currently in something that's already in the same timeline um so it's very strange to see them out of that character let's see if like for instance if we see sansa in this character playing a princess or playing a warrior it, 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 it doesn't it doesn't quite click um for me for there um, the other thing that I, I know in uh, Blue It, you we were mentioning this for it as well. Um, and the mage was very difficult to understand. Um, and uh, Mike, you say because she's French and Italian, and that's how she really talks. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> is she is she learned English five years ago. I'm sorry if that's the case. Then maybe you should not cast her in this movie <laughs> because it was very distracting um, to kind of see her. And the other I thing, think- I thought that was strange. Here's the thing, though, because I don't think Blue, it, you may have seen Warcraft, but Moreno, you definitely have. The mm-hmm. one thing that have. the immediate thing that triggered in my mind was I can't really understand what she's saying. That's a weird dialect. It's a weird thing she's trying to say. Or says it reminds me of in Warcraft when Garona was trying to talk. And that's Paula Patton because she had her weird teeth in her mouth that clearly was a terrible, not a good sign. 
it was really you could not hear any of her dialogue uh, the majority not any of it you couldn't hear the majority of the dialogue because you could see that she had these prosthetics in her mouth and it was difficult to talk with um yeah so that was a kind of a bummer because she was a pretty interesting she was a pretty big part of this movie and by far i think she saved their asses so many times that she got really like no love or anything for that one. So I thought I thought that was kind of a uh, bummer, and not love like literal love, but as a director, they didn't really get they didn't really shoo her in of hey thank you or something like that. Uh, she kind of was made to be a weaker character at some points than a stronger mm-hmm. one. So it was kind of a bummer. Yeah, not only was she hard to understand, but I felt like her accent was somewhat inconsistent throughout the movie too. Like it sort of fluctuated a bit here and there, and there wasn't really a rhyme or reason to it. Yeah, it just happened. Yeah, so I mean, it's not not the worst of things. Now we're just talking about kind of a couple of different nitpicks because I, she didn't have. I liked lines. it because it was kind of foreign. Like they made the mages seem like these foreign entities, like not inundated in standard like English society. And I, I kind of enjoyed the the strange accent. It was a little bit hard to understand, but I mean, it wasn't like it was a forced bad accent because yeah. that's really just how she she talked. Yeah, it was just a natural bad accent. Um, yep, yeah, so the uh, I guess my last couple ones, um, e- this movie needs more battle sequences that looks badass. Um, I felt like we only got two, um, and it just needs more. Like, I don't, you don't have to show me all of them, because I know that's an expensive, that's a very expensive way he held his uh, hands on, his hold his uh, two hands on the sword. That's very expensive. You gotta be more consistent with that also, because I know at times you were holding it with one hand, but you were still activating all the power, and I was really confused of what was happening once and not the other, but whatever. Um, so, at least give me more battle scenes that shows that maybe he's like learning how to do it, you know, like he's building up to it, like he holds it for like a couple seconds and then stops maybe. So I, I just need at least maybe four or five of those in this movie. Like you definitely can kind of ramp up a couple different things and make get, get creative with it. You don't need two. You don't need one long one that looks all CG because that's not going to be worth it. Um, yeah, so, I mean, not too many criticisms. There's a bunch of other ones. There's no need to for me to, like, talk about this movie, like, dissect it to, like, how I thought a lot of things were bad. But as an overall, going into this movie, I thought already that, hey, I'm going to suspend my disbelief a little bit. I thought there's a lot of cool scenes, like the assassination scene really felt like, I know you're talking about a video game scene, Mike, uh, like, that felt like an Assassin's Creed moment almost. And it kind of felt, uh, it, it was really cool how they staged it and how they were talking about, hey, this is how we're going to do. And then, like, Guy Ritchie does a flashback of them training on, hey, this is how we're going to kill this person. And then they go back into the main story uh, arc. And, like, that run that runaround scene, which was dope, and, like, turning left and turning right. And, uh, Mike Moreno, I know that you appreciate this part. I hope you picked up on it. Of when the... Uh, the good guys, right? King Arthur's men were all running through the the maze, basically trying to escape. Did you pick up on the signaling? Oh hell yeah! yeah. It was very much like Attack on Titan yeah. style, <laughs> where they were shooting canisters of yeah. uh, like colored smoke into the air to let them know where they were. Oh, uh, I thought I immediately I was like, oh, 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 oh my gosh, nobody's gonna get nobody's gonna get this part. So it's, it's whatever. <laughs> uh, that was awesome, but like that's like an old old school way of communicating without yelling that that's that's weird but that's some weird stuff they actually kind of put into the movie but um i, I like that portion of it here and like i said like i was already coming to this movie saying that this i'm gonna like this movie um so i'll i'll end uh i guess like the role of kind of criticisms and let's start wrapping up with our conclusions and start talking about grades and um you know i'll go first and i'm just talking about since i'm talking anyway of you know overall i thought this movie was very entertaining um very fun i had a great time with it um, like I said, I got chills a bunch of different parts. I like some of the actors of it. I'm really hoping, um, and this is it's, it's a bit rare because, you know, it's not doing very well in the box office. And I really hope they don't cancel it, but they end up my, may. I also want to see these characters again because I want to see how these characters grow into the next movie. So I don't want them to gut it out like they did 300 because that 300 second movie was awful. The reason why everybody loved the 300 movie Besides the visual effects, right? Everybody was ripped. That was the first time that literally everybody like had a weird training plan that they dedicated to. And they like sent it out. It was this huge marketing thing. But 
And they, CGI. Yeah. They CGI'd every single one of those guys' yeah. abs. But they still had, a, like, they still Don't use really a lot of practical effects. They, they use more practical effects, I think, just to show the amount of people that were there. Uh, but, you know, it's, it was a sense of brotherhood. You know, it was a sense of fighting for something that they believe in. And it was a sense of fighting for something so much and believing in the, the group instead of one being that... We all know that they're going to die. We're just trying to see, hey, what's an interesting... Show me an interesting way of how these 300 men face these millions of people, probably thousands, of people and a, a creative way of how they actually died. Um, and that's a, a, fairly di- a very, very different retelling. That's why I love... I still love 300. Like, Gerald Butler, Gerard Butler, and all the people in that movie, which, yes, there was a bunch of people that was in Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones still, but that was before the time. So, that was actually fun. Um, I like that movie. Um, so, I will say my grades for this movie is going to be a B. Um, I was trending on the B+, plus, but not quite. Um, I, you know, as a list of like all the ones here, it's kind of like the lower, kind of lower mid-tier of all the Guy Ritchie films. Uh, but I did see a couple other weird ones that, eh, it was kind of okay with like Rock and Rolla and other ones. But, uh, you know... Also, definitely say I'll definitely go check it out. Like, I'm excited to talk about this movie. I really wish and I really hope more people go out and see the movie. It's not as bad as people are saying it because people are trashing this movie. Uh, but it, it's, it's not as bad as I think it is. So It's funny because I have yet to meet a single person that I know in real life that has given this movie a bad remark. It's like literally only critics. And, I, and then the fact that no one's going to see it. It's weird. It's like I, public opinion, I feel like it's fairly high in my friend circle, but apparently no one else, which I don't know what that says about my friends. Your friends are weird. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Blue, what's your grades and conclusions? So I think that it was a great stylized action flick. Um left a little bit, bit to be desired, but uh, I, I thought it was pretty fun uh, I give it a B overall um, I think I comparatively I, I had I had less fun than Guardians uh, because that movie was incredible um, but I think I had more fun I'd rather spend the money to go see this movie than Alien yes absolutely. out of our last couple of reviews they all <laughs> vaguely fall within that Action, science fiction ish sub camp, and I think if I had to put money on all of them, I'd say I'd go pay again to see Guardians. But if it was down to those two, I'd pay money more money to go see King Arthur than Alien Covenant. For sure, for sure. Yeah, Marina, conclusions. Yeah, so I feel like I tend to typically trend on the higher end when it comes to doing movie uh, ratings specifically for down the front, but this one I'm going to have to go lower than you both and give it a B minus. Um, you know, it was, and don't get me wrong. This was a fun movie. This was an excellent start to the summer blockbuster season. Um, if you're looking for a Guy Ritchie fix, you should see this movie because this is grade a Guy Ritchie through and through. It just doesn't live up to the pedigree of Guy Ritchie's previous movies, as well as, you know, what the... I I don't think it lived up to its full potential, um, but it was definitely worth the money to see because it was fun and because it hit those sweet spots that I I like. Um, A little bit to Mike's point, if you've only got 15 bucks on you, or 18 bucks if you live in New York City, and can only go see one movie this weekend, if you want to have fun, watch King Arthur. Um... Well, definitely go see Guardians of the Galaxy first. But if you haven't seen it already, then go watch. It <laughs> didn't go watch King Art there. It's fun. It's a good movie, but it's just it's not amazing. And I think that kind of shows in how it's taken at the box office. Um, so yeah, B minus. I mean, you can also get creative, and you can go to the movie theater with eighteen dollars and leave watching both. So you never know for that. Yeah, I mean, and with that, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm really glad to hang out with these guys and uh, hang out. And thank you for listening to us as a Down in Front podcast that we review the uh, King Arthur storytelling of The Legend of the Sword by Guy Ritchie. Uh, with some of my favorite people here, I got uh, Mike. Where can we find more of your work? 
Which one? <laughs> <laughs> he, well, we all know my we, first name is Mocha. Yeah, we're, we're doing this all through Skype, so uh, he literally pointed at a TV screen that had both of our shining faces looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, my friends. Uh, Mocha, where can we find more of your work? Uh, yeah, you can find me, um, as per usual, on Twitter, at MochaMikeLI. Um, you know, I go on there and I post... Uh, what I like to think are funny tweets, but are usually just cries for help. <laughs> and oh, you can also geez. find my photography work on Instagram at, at Mocha Mike. Um, there's no LI then, there because I got on that early enough before any 64 year old uh, jazz flute playing sons of bitches could have gone and stolen it from, from me. So at Mocha Mike on Instagram, at Mocha Mike LI for now on Twitter. Nice. Uh, Blue it, what you got? So uh, you can find me on my email address, pulljessie's magic sword at gmail.com. This is the stupidest bit ever, but I love it. Keep it going. It's like the only reason I come back. Uh, And the only reason Jesse has it. (laughs) Pull Jesse's magic sword. At gmail.com, uh, it's the best. It, you'll get a surprise at the end. Um, if you don't want to email me, though, and I understand that, because who has time for email, uh, you can check us out at uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all that fun stuff. Uh, Minus underscore band or Minus underscore music or maybe just Minus bands. I think they're all, all of that is inclusive. Um yeah, we're playing in June. We're playing in July. We're playing some other times. Check us out if you're in the Boston area. You will be disappointed. No, not at all. It's such a fun show. Definitely go check it out. It's a lot of fun. These guys have a good time. They straight rock it out. I mean, it, it's just so much fun. So definitely go check their music out. Um, for us as well, uh, you know, we do have a Patreon. We have a Facebook. We have an email. We have a Twitter. But the couple of things I'm going to be kind of posting about... Please feel free to go ahead and tweet at us. It's at underscore D-I-F-P. That's at underscore Down in Front Podcast. You know, our Facebook is facebook.com slash D-I-F Podcast. So definitely go ahead and find that. Uh, Click it. You can actually see a lot of the same information that we're posting, especially of previous episodes as well as potential future episodes that we're actually going to be talking about. We have read it. We're on Stitcher, so we're not only on um, or Apple Podcasts. So definitely kind of check that out as well. Uh, and then the other thing that we are is um, Patreon. So we're on patreon.com slash down in front. And then most recently, we actually got on YouTube. And we're really excited. Although uh, we had a, a, a bit of a Disney complications with our first one, we're really excited to keep going with this. Um, yeah, so- word of advice, don't fuck with Disney's legal team. <laughs> yeah. They are fast like lightning. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we'll we'll link in. We'll we'll go ahead and tweet out exactly what we're talking about. Uh, we don't want to like hold you up, but uh, uh, definitely go find our YouTube channels at youtubecom slash podcast. And with that, uh, my name is Warren. I'm with my two buddies, Mike and Mike. And we want to say uh, thanks so much for hanging out with us tonight, and have a good night. And remember, audience, if you pull Jesse's magic sword, make sure you use both hands. <laughs>